so thank you. Uh, for time reason, I didn't include the spinal cord in my talk, but uh, we, will, we can discuss this point at the end. So radiation-induced central nervous system toxicity comprises a wide spectrum of clinical radiological complications determining variable neurological manifestation, and brain radiation can induce focal or diffuse effects, which are influenced by several factors, as you can see in this list. And regarding the physiopathology of brain injury, the underlying mechanism is still unknown. And the most prominent histopathological changes related to brain radiation are characterized by parenchymal and vascular damage. And several studies have been performed in the past in order to identify the primary target cell populations involved. And two main theories have been postulated. The vascular damage hypothesis, according to which uh, parenchymal damage is the result of a primitive damage of small vessels, or an alternative hypothesis of a direct glioneuronal damage. However, currently, uh, the most accepted explanation is that parenchymal and vascular damage are the results of both a direct injury and an indirect damage mediated by pro-inflammatory factors. So a complex interplay between different processes where inflammation play an important <laughs> role. Classification of radiation therapy central nervous system toxicity traditionally is based on timing of clinical presentation and uh, comprises three main categories, acute, early delayed, and late delayed effects, and late delayed effects are the most important sequela of brain radiation because the majority are irreversible. Acute damage uh, to the brain is very rare with current radiotherapy techniques. Patients can be asymptomatic or present with signs of increasing inf intracranial pressure. However, imaging is usually not performed in the acute phase and patients are managed clinically. However, in the subacute phase, radiation therapy can induce vasogenic edema and demyelination to, of the white matter, which is generally reversible, as you can see in this uh, examination, and usually the clinical course is benign. However, in the subacute phase, in patients with primary brain tumors, both children and adults, Treated with concomitant chemotherapy and radiotherapy, there can be a different and more important side effects. Uh, this is a patient with a glioblastoma and was treated with chemo and radiotherapy. Three months after the end of treatment, you can see uh, prominent vasogenic edema, uh, increased contrast enhancement, increased size of the lesion. Well, at our, at our hospital, our neuro oncologists have direct access to the PACs, and they can see the images in real time. And even before the end of the examination, they call us and want to know what's going on. And the question is, is this a, a nearly disease progression or a pseudo progression? And pseudoprogression is a subacute treatment-related reaction and uh, is induced by a pronounced local tissue reaction with a prominent inflammatory component. I have to say that answering to this question is often a dilemma, and I will give you the answer of this case later. This is another case. Uh, again, a patient with an eye-gray glioma deeply located treated with chemo and radiotherapy four months after the end of treatment. You can see uh, increased contrast enhancement of the lesion. The pattern of contrast enhancement is uh, ill-defined, irregular, with a pseudonecrotic appearance. This has been described in the literature as a sort of Swiss and cheese pattern of contrast enhancement and might favor a radiation-induced enhancement, however, is non-specific. But again, in our diagnostic armamentarium, we have other imaging tools such as diffusion, perfusion, and spectroscopy. And we can apply these techniques. And uh, in this case, we did a mass spectroscopy, but uh, if you look at the uh, mass spectroscopy profile, it's very similar to the spectrum of the primary lesion be before the uh, treatment. Uh, 
This is the diffusion imaging, and there is facilitated diffusion. There is increased ADC. Uh, so this, in contrast, might favor a radiation-induced enhancement. But if you look at the perfusion imaging that we performed with both uh, a contrast technique, a classic DSC perfusion imaging, of an, or a non-contrast technique, this is arteria spin labeling perfusion imaging, you can see increased signal in keeping with increased perfusion. And in pseudoprogression, there is usually reduced perfusion, so the opposite of this case, whereas a mass spectroscopy or diffusion imaging can show a variable pattern. This patient was surgically treated, and histology turned out to be a progressive disease, and this is the follow-up in two months, where you can see, again, disease relapse and progression, and the child died in a few months. Uh, PET imaging can also be extremely helpful to differentiate pseudoprogression from early disease progression, PET imaging with amino acid tracers. This is a very nice example from the literature in a patient with a glioblastoma that was scanned with fat PET. Fat is a foretyl tyrosine, it's an amino acid tracer. Usually in high-grade gliomas, there is an increased expression of amino acid carrier, and this is the rationale behind the increased uptake in a high-grade glioma. And eight weeks after radiochemotherapy, you can see in this case a uh, marked increase of contrast enhancement, extension of flare abnormalities in keeping with vasogenic edema. But if you look at the degree of fat uptake, it's reduced when compared to the uh, prior examination. And this is in favor of a pseudoprogression. And actually, on follow-up, there was reduction of contrast enhancement and reduction of vasogenic edema. However, even though there is a huge literature regarding the role of advanced MR imaging techniques and of PET imaging in order to discriminate uh, pseudoprogression from early disease progression. In the real world, the only way to reliably discriminate the two conditions is to perform close follow-up. And this is the first case that I showed you. And Two months later, there was disappearance of the vasogenic edema and reduction in size of the lesion. Late delayed effects, again, can be also focal or diffuse. And among focal effects, radiation necrosis shows similarities in terms of imaging appearance with pseudoprogression. Uh, radiation necrosis is a late delayed effect, so usually occurs months or even years after the end of treatment. The majority of cases is within three years after radiotherapy. And in radiation necrosis, there can be different scenarios, which depends on the primary tumor location, uh, if it's a head and neck tumor or a primary brain tumor. And this is extremely important to know the radiotherapy plan in order, in order to better interpret the picture. On imaging, radiation necrosis is a focal contrast enhancing mass with central necrosis surrounded by vasogenic edema. Several funny names have been introduced in the literature to, des to describe this pattern of contrast enhancement, but all these descriptions are non-specific. Again, we can use advanced MR imaging techniques. In radiation necrosis, there is usually low perfusion. There is uh, the pattern on diffusion can be variable, even though facilitated diffusion is more common in radiation necrosis. And on mass spectroscopy also, there can be extreme variability, but when <coughs> present, a prominent lipid peak is suggestive of a radiation necrosis. This is a patient with a urine sarcoma treated with high-dose chemotherapy and radiotherapy. One year later, there, is, there are new areas of contrast enhancement, but as you can see, one of these areas show restricted diffusion. So this might favor a, a tumor. However, if you look at the perfusion imaging, there is no lack of uh, increased perfusion and the prominent lipid peak on MR spectroscopy. So putting together these findings are more suggestive of a radiation necrosis, and actually this turned out to be a radiation necrosis. However, things are usually much more complicated. And this is a patient with a glioblastoma 
Uh, this is a follow-up three months after surgical procedure. There is no evidence of residual disease. Uh, this patient was treated with uh, uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and nine months after radiochemotherapy, you can see uh, new areas of signal abnormalities on flare, and this flare hypersignal is along the radiotherapy field. Uh, there are three new areas of contrast enhancement. Two of these new areas of contrast enhancement show restricted diffusion, and on perfusion imaging, there is only one lesion that shows increased perfusion. So how to put together all these findings? And the problem is that in the real world, it's often extremely difficult to uh, differentiate radiation necrosis from uh, disease relapse because the two conditions can be combined. And actually, this was a patient where there was a combination of both recurrent glioblastoma and treatment-related changes. There is, again, also suggestion from the literature that uh, PET imaging with amino acid tracers can be helpful to discriminate radiation necrosis from uh, recurrent disease. Uh, this is an example of two patients studied with DOPA. DOPA is, again, another amino acid tracer similar to methionine, similar to FET. And uh, here you can see in this contrast enhancing lesion marked increased uptake in keeping with the recurrent JBM and lack of increased uptake in keeping with radiation necrosis, but also PET imaging has not been validated in large trials similar to advanced imaging techniques. All these techniques have not been validated in large trials. So even though there are so many results in the literature, if you want to translate statistical results into a single given patient, uh, it's often extremely difficult to apply statistical results to a single patient. Uh, radiation therapy can also induce uh, diffuse white matter injury with demyelination if it occurs in a late delayed phase. In, in a late delayed phase, uh, this is a permanent demyelination and uh, can have also a progressive course with extensive injury of the white matter. However, there is no clear correlation between the degree of involvement of the white matter and the clinical picture, and often there are very subtle neurological signs despite an extensive involvement of the white matter. Vascular injury is another important complication of radiation therapy, and the most common vascular lesion induced by radiation therapy are represented by cerebral cavernous malformations, also called cavernomas. <laughs> and uh, radiation-induced cavernomas have similar appearance of in, of, on imaging uh, when compared to sporadic or genetically determined cavernomas. On CT, they appear as hyperdense focal lesion with a, a salt and pepper appearance on T1 and T2. On gradient echo, there is always a blooming effect, and uh, angiographically, they are silent. To better detect uh, small cavernomas instead of conventional gradient echo imaging, susceptibility weighted imaging is recommended. And susceptibility weighted imaging, in addition to uh, cavernomas, can also detect tiny hypointense foci, and these are called cerebral microbleeds. And cerebral microbleeds are another late delayed complication of radiation therapy. Uh, cavernomas can present with macrohemorrhagic events. They are prone to uh, bleeding uh, with epilepsy or can be totally asymptomatic. And these are all patients who are treated with radiotherapy. Regarding the natural history of cavernomas, in the whole literature, a greater risk of bleeding was attributed to radiation-induced cavernomas when compared to sporadic cavernomas. However, in our experience, the vast majority of radiation-induced cavernomas is uh, asymptomatic. Uh, Macrohemorrhagic events is extremely rare, so we just recommend observation for a symptomatic lesion while surgery should be reserved to symptomatic growth or hemorrhage. Radiation therapy can also induce vasculopathy. Uh, 
and uh, a particular there can be a particular type of vasculopathy characterized by progressive stenosis of the distal internal carotid artery and the proximal circle of Willis with a, a pattern of collateralization, a deep pattern of collateralization due to perforating arteries. And on angiography, this pattern is very similar to a puff of smoke, hence the name Moya Moya. And Moya Moya uh, vasculopathy, uh, when it's associated to an underlying medical condition, is called quasi Moya Moya disease or Moya Moya syndrome. And this is a patient uh, with uh, uh, a residual clivoscordoma who was treated with proton therapy with, with a very high dose. And uh, in this patient, you can see that uh, uh, six months after the end of treatment, there was stenosis of anterior cerebral arteries and three months later, irregularity of the middle cerebral artery on the left side, and this patient underwent surgical revascularization before a deep pattern of uh, collateralization. But in the natural history of uh, Moya Moya, there can be cerebral infarcts, and if untreated, the pattern can be devastating with extensive parenchymal damage and extensive vascular damage. In addition to vasculopathy, this is extremely rare, but radiation therapy can also induce aneurysm formation. And uh, uh, radiation-induced aneurysm are considered a higher risk of bleeding when compared to sporadic aneurysm. And this is a patient with a craniopharyngioma treated with uh, radiotherapy, and several years later, he developed this uh, aneurysm of the anterior cerebral artery. This is a young uh, uh, adult uh, that was treated with radiotherapy when he was a child. If you look at the T1, there is an increased <coughs> signal in the basal ganglia. Uh, this is similar to gadolinium accumulation in the brain, but uh, if you look at the pattern five years later, there is also extensive hyperintensity in the corpus triatum in the uh, thalami, and uh, the reason of the T1 hyperintensity is this extensive calcific deposition in the basal ganglia at the interface between the gray and white matter. This pattern is called mineralizing microangiopathy. It's much more common in children. is rare in adult patients and is related to a microvessel injury. Finally, uh, Martina, Filippo, and Luigi these are all children and adolescents who fight it against their cancer, and they won their battle against cancer. However, they were unlucky because several years later, they developed a new cancer. And unfortunately, radiation in childhood clearly increases the risk of subsequent central nervous system tumors, Meningioma and gliomas are the most common secondary central nervous system tumors, whereas in adults, there is less evidence that radiation therapy can induce a radiation-induced brain tumor. So with this bird's eye view on uh, imaging of uh, central nervous system toxicity, I'm done, and I thank you very much for your attention.